Welcome to the Fast Track of Innovation, a data-driven podcast. Here, data isn't just numbers, it's your superpower, sparking stories of success from bites to breakthroughs. Dive deep into insights from the Data-Driven Conference, where data heroes assemble. Ready to supercharge your data journey? Strap in, it's time to get data-driven. Sponsored by Reltio. Reltio's AI-powered data unification and management cloud capabilities encompasses entity resolution, multi-domain SaaS, master data management, or MDM, and 360 data products. Reltio helps enterprises transform poor quality data from disparate sources into unified, trusted, and interoperable data. All right. Welcome to another data-driven podcast. I'm Chris Detzel, and today we have special guest, Gordy Brooks. Gordy, how are you? I'm doing well, Chris. How about yourself? Oh, man, I'm doing really great. And I've been looking forward to doing this podcast for a couple of weeks now. I've been meaning to ask you like a month or two ago, and then we were at our company, SCO, and then I just said, hey, man, why don't we do a podcast? And you're like, yeah, oh, let's do it. Yeah, I'm excited. So I think there's a lot of great content to cover and looking forward to having a conversation with you about it. Yeah, me too. So uh, before we get completely started, just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do today, and then your journey, background, and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. I've been in, I'm born and raised here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I've been a uh, financial executive for the last 30 plus years. Overall, I've been a CFO in the Valley since 2009. Public companies, private companies, took a company public, took a company private, took a co- spun a company out, as you remember, with uh, Strix Get-Go uh, yeah. and merged with Log Me In. So done about every transaction you can imagine. Started out life as an auditor, but I actually started out life as a musician. So I studied piano as an undergraduate. Was involved. I bet a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, you no, know? It's, there's a big, as everybody likes to say, there's a lot of relationship between music and math. And my dad okay. was a CPA, so I grew up in that environment, had no interest in it whatsoever, and <laughs> wanted to be a musician. Realized I was a pretty mediocre musician, so I better find another line of work. And <laughs> so I ended up gravitating all the way back to finance, which kind of made my dad happy. So yeah. yeah, it's been great. But it's a lot of the same skills and techniques of recognizing patterns and being quantitative, looking through through information for those patterns. So I think those great tool sets to learn from that background. So you're now the CFO at Reltio. How, tell us a little bit about how you get to Reltio. And yeah, what that I, looks uh, like. again, I love this size company. So the, the company I came from, Financial Force, was about yeah. $150 million company at the time. Reltio, when I joined three years ago, was $75 million of ARR. Uh, yeah. Relatively small, but really... Again, where I am interested is coming in, building the foundation for the companies in their background infrastructure and be able mm-hmm. to get ready for that next step. I love at that classic. I like bringing order to the chaos. I'm not, I've been in larger companies, but you tend to maintain the systems you've already put in place as opposed yeah. to you know, putting them in place from scratch. So that's what attracted me to Relteo and the data space at the time. So it's been a great journey so far. Yeah, the data space is booming. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But last year into kind of this year in the current economic climate, what are some big challenges Relteo is facing and probably other SaaS companies? And how do you address them to ensure we continue to grow and and we stay stable in a lot of ways? The one real change that occurred in the last 18 months was really the change in interest rates, right? As inflation, Uh obviously a lot of things coming out of the pandemic and so many unforeseen items and cause and effect. But ultimately, after many years of basically 0% interest rates, inflation finally started to rear its head as people knew yes. it was going to do. And interest rates started to climb. And the impact for us was, and for companies like us was a couple of things. One is valuations are based on discounted cash flow. So the, the higher those mm-hmm. interest rates go up, the bigger the impact is on your valuation. So every private company and public company started to see an impact on the expected valuations 
overall. And our valuations had been at the height 18 months ago, and they just gradually started to tick down because the cost of capital became higher and higher. Um, and the other thing that happened is as investors looked at companies, they started to change their mind about what used to be growth at all costs. All I want you to do is grow as yeah. fast as you can. I don't care how much money you're burning through. And it came back very quickly into a different balance. So yes, we like growth, but we'd like you to start aiming for profitability. And every company, everybody was on this track of the faster I can grow, however I get there, that's my priority. I had to go ahead and reset their expectations. And you don't change those things overnight. Um, yeah. you know, so having to digest those things, go through planning processes, figure where your, your options are, took companies a lot of time. I think we did a really good job. And we, having been through a couple of these crises before, we saw some of these things coming and got ahead of the curve as far as our cost structure, but really taxed a lot of executive management across companies to uh, adapt to the marketplace. You've had so much experience in doing this. My assumption is that you are completely caught off guard and or like some people just freak out. How was your mindset on how did you have to <laughs> temper the, your, the executives at Relteo to, hey, look, I think we're okay. Here's why we're okay. I don't know. Did you have to do some of that? And what was your kind of thinking? Yeah, I know there's a little bit of that ha having the gray hair in the room, <laughs> having seen some of these things before, being measured about it. You never want to feel like you're freaking out over it, especially in the CFO role. Your yeah. role is to really be <laughs> measured and try to provide guidance and counseling, but be stern about actions needed to be taken. And so I think it's about laying out choices quickly, the ramifications, get buy-in across the team, and obviously to Manish, our CEO, and think hard at our size company to think longer term, but what actions can we take to really protect ourselves in the medium and long term? Uh, but you're absolutely right. I, my approach, and I think we'll probably talk about this, is that as a CFO, it's not just all the technical things you do. It's really being the agnostic person in the room to help guide an outcome and provide a little bit of that to the infrastructure of thinking for the team. Well, I think from a culture standpoint, you brought a lot of, obviously, knowledge and stability to, I remember you getting on calls and just saying, just, you were very, just, very good at calming everyone. No, with as my blood with, pressure raised. And sure, I'm sure, but uh, at the end of the day, you can't freak out, when, yeah. especially as an yeah. executive. Yeah, only one day did I freak out, and probably <laughs> the listeners here will uh, remember just about a year ago in the Silicon yeah. Valley banking crisis. That was probably the worst day of my professional life, uh, right. where you just realize that something's happening that nobody really foresaw. You have no control. Mm -hmm. And you have your, your company's resources at risk in something, yeah. you have no idea where it's going. It's those type of black swans that I think are the hardest because you have absolutely no control. Other ones, you can take steps or you can maybe scold yourself for not taking the right steps. But in that one, it was like, hey, there's nothing I can do here. Yeah. I, th I think overall, though, you handle it like a professional and, and it was really good. I couldn't tell like you were just, oh my gosh, but... <laughs> Yeah. No, I think everybody was, yeah. right? So it's not yeah, just totally. you, but I can't imagine being, you know, the CFO of a company that just probably lost everything. Absolutely. There's a great, I, for the folks who've watched the film, The Martian, which I love to quote, at the end, they ask Matt Damon, who got stranded on Mars, like he's talking to a bunch of students. And he goes, what did you do? And he goes, you just do the math. You take <laughs> one problem at a time. Yeah. You know, we all have a tendency to just get overwhelmed. Just Break it down into what you can control and solve the problem at a time and try to put the thing together and really hold yourself back from getting freaking out and getting overwhelmed by the elements. Yeah. And so thank you so much for that insight and being very upfront and honest. I certainly appreciate that. And just to turn this back around is you slightly mentioned this, but with over $100 million in annual recurring revenue or AR, could you share some like insights into some of the key strategies that have driven Realtio's growth and scalability in the data unification and management industry? Sure, absolutely. In the um, development of startup companies, there are certain milestones along the way, and certainly $100 million of revenue or ARR is one of those. And really what it's demonstrated for Realtio is that we, the products and services we have to offer have value to our customers. 
And so the take rate goes ahead and accelerates and your revenue begins to expand and it builds on itself to create that momentum. We focus obviously on a lot of high-end enterprise customers. Those enterprise customers spend, they uh, invest in your products and continue to build that out. So it shows that we are providing value in the marketplace. There's an opportunity and we're providing value into that marketplace and our customers are adopting it. And that's really the key. However, once you get to that mark, the game just gets mm -hmm. more difficult and uh, <laughs> it just, it, it never stops. So you have to continue to evolve and expand along those lines and adapt to the expectations and, and all in the marketplace. Yeah. It's I remember when we hit that milestone, there was this huge thing. We went to New York, it was on the ticker and so exciting. And we celebrated for a day or two and then we we're off to, yeah, how do yeah. we get to the next hundred million? Yeah, <laughs> or yeah, exactly. Right? So, what are we doing next week? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like, poor, that's... it's like poor sales folks. They always go, what have you done for me today? <laughs> Just close the corridor. Great job. Now it's yeah. day, day one of the next quarter and you got a bigger expectation. That, that's right. And being on some of these sales calls as of late, that's exactly how it is. It's like great quarter last year and great yeah. year last year. And so we have this quarter. What's going yeah. on? So you move on. Something that you've mentioned a lot in the past for our company is the rule of 40. It's a popular metric for SaaS companies, <laughs> balancing growth and profitability. So how does Realtio interpret and apply the rule of 40 in its financial planning and evaluation? Sure. And just for the audience to remind them, rule of 40 is really was created by the banking community because they, as they looked at public companies, software companies that had the highest valuations they really went ahead and did a, a kind of a regression test of, well, what factors do they have leading that appear to be leading to those valuations? And it was a combination of growth and profitability. And the idea was if your growth rate and your profitability percentage or free cash flow percentage, the best performing companies have that profile. So if I got 30% growth rate and my profitability is 10%, it adds up to 40 and so that really started to evolve to 18 to 24 months ago. But what started to happen again, as valuations came down with interest rates, is the combination of growth and profitability matters as well. So 40% mm. growth and 0% profitability is a little different than 0% growth and 40% profitability. So you still want to grow and growth still gets a premium overall in that equation even okay. though, again, investors have had an expectation of profitability is now a little bit more important than it was before. So we take a look at that as far as the evolution of our model of who we compare ourselves to in the marketplace and where we are, where we want to get to based on our size. So we try to triangulate uh, what are uh, investor expectations, what do we think is realistic, how does our financial model work? And really look to, you know, at our size now at 133 million of AR, we're still a growth company. So we still want to continue to grow at a quick pace. Yeah. Um, but we've layered in getting to profitability as a higher priority than say we may have had two years ago. And, and, and you can't turn on a dime necessarily. So you have to <laughs> massage all the elements to get there and prioritize them too, because you can't do everything at once. So we, yeah, definitely last year and this year we dialed in around Hey, how are we tracking? Where do we think this model can go? And what choices do we need to make to get it uh, dialed into that particular set of expectations? Yeah, and so it brings me to something that you brought up to our company not so long ago around this thinking of a rule of X. Yeah. So given the emerging discussions around the rule of X as, as an extension or alternative to rule of 40, which it sounds like it's more of an extension, how do you view its uh, applicability to Relteo's financial health and growth strategy. Yeah, absolutely. So, and rule of X as an extension really incorporates this notion that, hey, it's not just rule of 40, however you get there. It's rule of 40 with the premium placed on growth. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, and, and why is that? If you think back on it, investors are most interested in the highest growth companies because the higher your growth, the quicker you'll get bigger, the more profit you'll have in the future. Yeah. Right. It's a simple equation is that you don't want to be a slow growth company just because it takes so long to get to larger and larger profit expectations. So higher growth is still at a premium to profitability for our size stage company. And so we incorporate that as well. And that as we look at 
Do we want to grow, try to grow X percent versus Y percent? We always uh, tend towards the higher growth outcomes. And, and especially it's also driven by the market you're in. So in data unification, it's a high growth market. And yeah. therefore you want to keep pace with that market or even excel beyond it. So you're taking market share in that marketplace. There's no reason to be a slow grower in a high growth market because then you're losing traction overall. What kind of strategies have you proven most effective for relative on maintaining that healthy balance sheet while still investing in that growth? Yeah, it's a hard one. It's more, probably more <laughs> art than science. That's the thing. Yes, we've all become attached to metrics yep. in a SaaS model. Everything is measured based on metrics. And so we really try to look at, hey, where are we making investments and are they re returning? Are we actually getting something for our investments or what's ROI or return on those investments? But within certain parameters, we might have investments we'd like to make, but we only have a priority set of so many things we can do yeah. and the resources to do them. So what are debating those priorities and those outcomes? And then really trying to measure what you're getting for the investments. As we talked about at kickoff the other, our uh, company kickoff the other week, this notion of the dollar you're spending today is still an investment. It may yeah. be the dollar you had yesterday, but you're still making, we are still making a choice to invest in that activity. So changing the mindset to constantly challenge where we're spending the resources that we are and is that the highest priority outcome we're looking for. And that's what the best companies do is they just constantly challenge themselves on where they're applying resource to move the company forward. That's great. How does, how has Relteo adapted its customer acquisition and retention strategies in response to all this economic uh, uncertainty? Yeah, the key for all of us is it goes back to customer first. We're in business because we provide value to our customers and our customers are the ones that are in us and consuming our services and our products. And we really, I think it, it just highlighted how important it is to stay uh, connected to your customer and make sure you're providing value, understand the challenges they may have, especially, I like to say in a SaaS model, customers on a subscription. So they're really looking for value day one, right? Yeah. They're on the clock. Right. And therefore it's really incumbent upon us to constantly monitor and make sure the customers are getting the, uh, the value out of what they're receiving from us. Also, I think as we all realize in the SaaS industry, maintaining and keeping your current customer is a lot less expensive than having to go get a new one if you lose them, right? No one of the key parts and one of the reasons retention rates are monitored in the SaaS industry is it really talks about your economics and how efficient you are because you can hold on to your customer base and build on top of it, it means that there's less you have to go garner from a new customer standpoint. Now, you got to have a nice balance between I want new customers and I want to yeah. keep my keep my install <laughs> base happy because I got to keep growing. But yeah, keeping your customer base satisfied and engaged is critical. And I think for every function within a company. I love your answer. Basically, it's customer first. Coming from a CFO, yeah, I thought there would be some numbers or something, but I think I, I love the answer and, and as I'm focused in on solely the customer and truly believe that. And, and so I, I love that. Yeah, um, and I think in, ad in addition to that one item is that for all of us, I think during the challenges of the last 18 months and the economic environment and uncertainty early last year, we all look towards, hey, let's make sure our customers are locked in. If there are things yeah. we need to do to help them, that they're coming up for renewal or they're having their own challenges. How do we make sure to really go above and beyond to, to reinforce that relationship financially as well? I think a lot of SaaS companies really made sure to lock down their customer base and make sure that they were satisfied. An off the cuff question here is, as you look at the uncertain times, are they passing or what's your view of these uncertain times? Is it another here for another year or two or? Yeah, it's a great question. If I had a crystal ball, <laughs> I would say the height of uncertainty was calendar Q1 last year in 2023 yep. between the, the invasion of Ukraine, the banking crisis, the uncertainty, uh, interest rates rising so quickly. I mean, it was nobody really knew what to do. And, and a lot of business just stalled out because companies spent more time evaluating their spending rather than thinking about spending more. Uh, yeah. I think that level of uncertainty has certainly played itself out and we're 
at a stage in the last probably the last year or nine months of stability. Yeah. You know, I think we saw, especially with valuations starting to increase in Q4 and early Q1 here, valuation changes don't necessarily mean uncertainty is gone. But I think that you see a, ch- a change in the tenor as far as that's concerned. However, we had you know, elections on the horizon. Those create uncertainty. So I think a lot of the folks in the banking, the investment bankers have good fingers on the pulse of where things are going. And the feeling is we need to get through this year, through the election cycles and all that before people feel like so many of these things are behind us. Uh, but there's always uh, new things on the horizon that you didn't think about. So yeah. pro- probably steady course and speed is just continue to hunker down, do what we can do, and hopefully get through this year into into 2025 with a better view of things. Yeah, and it does seem like that <clears throat> Companies did slow down on buying other companies. And then I would just from looking at news, it seems like it's, I wouldn't say completely picking up, but you are starting to see more of yep. some more of that. And so that's at least, I think, a positive sign to some degree. And I think the other thing that's happened, especially for private companies, is for those that didn't react quickly mm. and reduce their burn, they started to run out of capital. Yeah. And with interest rates having risen as high and valuations coming down, they didn't quite have as many choices to raise new capital. I mean, debt was very expensive. Shareholders weren't going to support the prior valuations. So nobody wanted to do a down round from mm. a valuation standpoint. So I think companies that didn't plan ahead got into a pinch and therefore some of them made themselves available in the marketplace to be purchased. So I think that's still working its way through. Uh, yep. And I think what you see too is that private equity has been very active, but they tend to take out larger, more mature companies. You're starting to see more strategic activity of companies yep. buying other smaller companies. So again, these things come in cycle and they're probably in their mid wave of, of that overall cycle. Wow. Lots of wisdoms there, man. Really appreciate that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So when you look at the next five years with Realtio, what do you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities for Realtio? Any thoughts and, and things like that? For- uh, it's, a, it's a slam dunk. No, just kidding. The, yeah, I, you know, again, as I noted, once you get to this level, it's just not only sustaining the level of growth, but it is scaling. Yeah. Right. So to get larger, you need to continue to expand your operations, be efficient about it. As we've done internally, we have a big focus on automating things, right? Yeah. How can we free up resources to do more value-added things and automate the repeatable processes? I think that's keeping scaling a company is hard. And it's just as, as we referenced earlier, it's just the constant expectations getting larger and being able to be, again, efficient in growing the company and still meet those expectations. Keeping those things in, in line are really hard to do and require a lot of time and effort overall. So I think that it's, but, and the other one I'd add to that is that a lot of companies at this juncture start to figure out, do we, are there things we need to expand into beyond what we do to keep the growth moving? At yeah. Things? Yeah. And that's again, more art than science about was the time to diversify the portfolio or how far can we go with what we have to offer? You don't want to diversify too soon because it spreads the resources too thin. Um, so yeah, trying to make those choices along the way and hit each of those growth clip levels is something you just got to constantly monitor and, and pursue. We could probably have a whole pa- podcast around that particularly. Mm-hmm. It's just so intriguing to me. Well, when you think you about R and D. R&D processes, yeah. but you can't tell R&D I need it tomorrow. They've got <laughs> six, nine, 12 plus month cycles unless you go out and buy something. Yeah. Uh, and so you got to you plan in the short term, but R&D plans in the medium term overall. So you have to have those two things in balance too. So that, uh, that was really uh, inspiring and helpful, but uh, uh, there's so much more I want to ask. But my last question, for individuals looking at becoming a CFO in the tech industry, what skills and experience do you believe are crucial for success in that role? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I was pondering this, which is that CFOs, sorry, a little phone in the background. CFOs tend to have three different places they come from. They either come, they used to traditionally come from the accounting side of the house. Yeah. They can come from the finance side of the house or the, a lot more folks are coming from the investment banking side of the house because 
going ahead and developing the model and working with all the investors and constituents, buying companies. But whatever side you come from, I think the key is that I've always viewed the CFO as the business partner to the CEO. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I was talking about that last week. Yeah. And you look bit. at it, you know, you need to be agnostic. You're like the, the umpires in baseball to some degree. <laughs> I have an opinion, but yeah. the, but you got to help be the one with credibility to come to that has agnostic information without an agenda and to be able to learn how your leadership, including the CEO, operate to best influence or provide information or sometimes criticism in a way that's not threatening. And that's, there's a nuance to it. And every leader, every leadership team is a little bit different. And I've always felt that I have a certain way of operating, but I'm also trying to be attentive to the culture of the leadership team to, to be able to magnify my effectiveness. So I think you got to come to the game with the chops no matter what, but it's that nuance of really working with the team, influencing the team is critical. And then ultimately, it's also that relationship with the investors. And whether you're a private company or a public company, you have investors and the communication, the transparency, the credibility that you need to go ahead and engender is critical, you know, for the company as well. So th those are more soft skills. Yeah. You know, ultimately, you got to know your chops on all the other things, company model, et cetera. But it's really around, how, I think, how you manage and interact that can be, can be a real game changer. Wow. Gordy, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on data-driven podcast. So my name is Chris Detzel. Please don't forget to rate and review us. And until next time, thanks, Gordy. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. All right.